Are you concerned about big tech monitoring your data? Many of you might be aware that your actions on the internet are under surveillance. Tech companies and government agencies use this data to build profiles on you that monitor your beliefs, relationships, and habits. A lot of this data is harvested from the apps on your computer. One of my fans has designed a desktop app called Synthetic Notes, which is a normal notes app with several key differences. Unlike most apps, it doesn't use a subscription model. That means once you've bought it once, it's yours forever. Compare that to other companies that charge you over $100 a year. Synthetic Notes also stores all of your data on your local machine, away from psychoanalytic algorithms and cloud databases. This, combined with the fact that it's not a subscription app, means that Synthetic Notes never needs to connect to the internet. You can safely quarantine the app and it will still work completely fine. By paying for Synthetic Notes, you are buying back your privacy. Go to SyntheticApps.com forward slash Zuby and use my code Zuby, Z-U-B-Y, at checkout to get 25% off. That's SyntheticApps.com forward slash Zuby and use my code Zuby at checkout for 25% off. Protect your privacy. What's up, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls around the world? I would like to welcome you back to the Real Talk with Zuby podcast. Now, on today's episode, we have got on a returning guest. He is a friend of mine, super inspirational dude, and this is the one and only Dan Go. Welcome back. What's up, Zuby? Thank you so much for having me, and it's great to see you. I haven't seen you in such a long time, so it's good to see your face. No doubt, man. Well, we see yeah. each other every day in this weird online world. So, <laughs> but yeah. chatting, chatting, I was going to say in person, this also isn't in person, but yeah. it's a little, one step closer. <laughs> Absolutely. No doubt, man. So how how you been? It's been a, I've seen a lot of growth with everything you're doing since the last time we spoke. So give us an update on what's going on. Yeah. So the Twitter account is where all things come from. So I've grown, I think I've grown maybe from, I think I was like 50K at January 2020, and now I'm at 150K, somewhere around there. And it's almost surreal to think about it. I'm wondering like how Zuby, how you actually deal with, you know, the, the following that you have. Because <laughs> <laughs> the crazies are starting to come out, you know, like oh, yeah. you know, the weird guys, the weird people. But yeah, so I've grown that. I've uh, been working on High Performance Founder, which is my main business, and uh, that's where we help high-achieving entrepreneurs uh, get into incredible shape. We've grown uh, that company by 100%. And throughout amazing. the whole entire time, just trying to learn how to be an amazing dad and an amazing husband to my family. We've been traveling around for the past year. We've been literally squatting from one place <laughs> to another. My dad calls it professional squatting or professional Airbnb squatting. And we haven't had really a place that we've settled into uh, mm. yet. So. So it's been an, an adventure with them and we've got to see our baby grow for the past uh, year. And that's been amazing. That's amazing. Um, I know you don't talk about it too much on Twitter, but I, is that because of the madness that's going on back home? Is that a motivator? Um, yes, absolutely. So mm. the very first time that we left, uh, I think it was December of 2020, we knew what was going to happen again. Uh, we, we've been through the first lockdown and that was great because we got to stay with our baby and just be there with her. And then once December came around, we're just like, we know that they're going to lock down things again. We know that restrictions are happening and we know that most of the restrictions and most of the lockdowns are, are not things that we agree with. Yeah. So we decided to be sovereign and to move to places that allow us to live the life that we want to live. And the funny thing about all of these places. So we lived in Costa Rica, we lived in Mexico, or uh, we're living in Mexico right now. Uh, everything's the same. Nothing has changed. They're like, people are living the lives that they're living mm -hmm. and it is completely normal. There is no paranoia. So it was, it was kind of funny because we came back to Toronto. And when I came back to Toronto, I just looked around at the people that were just like walking the streets and they felt defeated man they yeah. felt utterly defeated do you feel like the same thing in in london as well because know that you just came back london's london's fine yeah okay london so everyone's fine. just yeah like, okay. the uk is one of the the uk actually has virtually well let me not say the uk let me say england because actually it varies mm. between england scotland and wales but england basically has no restrictions um they brought back the indoor mask mandate which some people follow and some people don't. It's certainly not enforced. They brought that back a couple weeks ago. 
But there, there's no lockdown. There's no, uh, you know, checking papers and all that stuff. You can live your yeah. life. You can go to your, the gym. You can travel. Everything's, it's pretty normal. There's still some level of weirdness and fear in the air, but it's nothing compared to, you know, I've been to, I've been to seven countries as well during this thing. And, you know, when I was in places like Portugal or certain parts of the USA, like New York, L.A., I felt exactly what you said, just demoralized people, fearful people, anxious. And then you go to Texas or Florida and it's boom, suddenly totally different. It's almost like the world's bifurcated into these two alternate realities. And you you maybe kind of at this stage, just pick which one you want to live in. Yeah, exactly. I, I feel the exact same way. And, uh, and yeah, we were just in Toronto and we knew it's going to come again. It, it, like, it's just rinse, wash and repeat. So we were just like, screw this. We're going to Mexico. Mm-hmm. It's going to happen during the winter time. They're going to shut things down. They're going to restrict things. So we're not going to stay there for that. Uh, we want to live life. And one of the things that we realized was how much the restrictions and lockdowns actually aged the people around us. Mm. Did you, did you know, I don't know if you noticed that, but like when I talk to people on like FaceTime, when I talk to people back home, they looked like my dad looked like he aged like 10 years and he looks like the youngest, like 75 year old I've ever met. And he looked like he was, he had more bags under his eyes and he just he didn't look great. And I was just like, I'm, I just want to miss that. I, I don't want to do that to my family. And I don't want my, my girl to, to live in that that type of environment at least just from a kid's standpoint yeah and everything that i'm doing right now is so my daughter can be allowed to be a kid just live so, just yeah. live you know that that's the crazy thing you know I've, you know me i rag on i've been ragging on about it from from early but yeah. it's like people are so afraid of dying that they've stopped living you know they're mm-hmm. merely existing but what is life to just live in this state of zombie-like fear of movement of other human beings of people's faces of socialization um that that's no way to live you know that's no way to live and it's gone on for so long now at this point where it's just like okay guys you know um are you you gonna move on or is this just are you just accepting this as your new reality yeah, I feel like we're on the fourth upsell of COVID right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Only the fourth. We just, yeah, like, we just gotta get through a couple more upsells until until it's over. Maybe, possibly, I don't know. But yeah. but I, I I'm I'm clicking no to the upsells right now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I think those of us kidding. who are I, I have noticed that those of us who are involved in like sales and, and, and marketing and stuff like yeah. that to a degree have, have kind of been able to see <laughs> yeah. some of the some of the tactics that are yeah. that are going on here. I'm like, uh no, I want to cancel my free trial. Um yeah. my, my free my free subscription to communism. I, I don't yes. like this. <laughs> I'm, I'm I'm canceling. This is enough. Like otherwise it just keeps auto renewing. It just keeps going yeah. and going and oh going. yeah we're on a subscription model right now. So <laughs> Yeah, no doubt, man. But uh, you've had a lot of growth with um with your business. It's been it's been amazing to see. I saw you just hit hundred fifty thousand on on Twitter. Um, just about a, I don't know when this episode will come out, but you know a couple of days ago from when we recorded this. And I remember when I first spoke to you in twenty nineteen, uh, you had four K. So to go from four thousand to one hundred fifty thousand, that in itself is phenomenal and just seeing the amount of engagement you're getting and people you're communicating with and everything that you're doing. It's, uh, I love to see it, man. I love watching people win, especially people who, who I'm friends with. Um, and so what's that journey been like over those past two years? It's, uh, it's been a journey for sure. And the, one of the things about this journey is, is obviously the cliche is, has taught me a lot about myself and especially the, the insecurities I have, uh, especially the insecurities is, you know, when you're going through social media, you're really putting yourself out there. So a lot of the things that you were thinking before that may have never come out, uh, they usually come out when you're possibly like triggered by something that you see on like, you know, whatever Twitter. And then for me, it's been very much a self-development journey as 
as uh, a man you know i got to see kind of like where are my weak areas emotionally where are my weak areas intellectually and it's and in that sense it's been very eye-opening and i've grown up a lot from growing from like 4k to 150k and on the other end it's given me this platform in order to speak my truth authentically in a way that uh, will influence a mass amount of people. I think I told you this in the very, I told you this actually the very first time that we met is like, how do you deal with this? You have like the keys to the nuclear codes, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> you can press a button and then boom, like you're yeah. going to get all sorts of reactions and all sorts of people coming your way. And, I definitely don't take that for granted. Yeah. Uh, I definitely want to impart my message out there into the world in the best way that I can. And the people that it's actually brought into my sphere of influence has been utterly incredible. Obviously, yourself, uh, the very first time that you and Jose came out with uh, that uh, program and you guys had that uh, that call as Oh, yeah, the yeah. upsell right yeah, or yeah. whatever <laughs> i was like i'm taking this yeah. I, this is an upsell i can be down with you know i'm down with this upsell right here so i took it and it's gotten me in touch with guys like yourself uh guys like james clear guys like just 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 people that i've always admired in my life and because of my thoughts and because of the way that i've done twitter it has attracted these people into my sphere of influence and and that's something that I just cherish because, mm. because for me, it's just like, if I can get around uh, great thinkers like yourself, great thinkers like uh, these authors, these entrepreneurs, these founders, it up levels me in, in a tremendous way. And that's why I say I've grown so much because I've been able to uh, just be able to see kind of like, you know, be able to interact with you and your tweets and see exactly where you're coming from. I've been able to interact with everyone else's tweets and that's actually opened up my world view. So now mm -hmm. when I talk to someone that's like uh, quote unquote, like normie or what, whatever people talk, call it, they, it's almost like I'm talking from this like different sphere of knowledge mm -hmm. where I've been, where I've been imparted this knowledge from multiple angles from everywhere around the world. And that's, that's something that I, that's, that's my value. You know, I'm, I'm all about growing and I'm all about improving. So so yeah, I'm very appreciative, very grateful. And actually one of the biggest lessons is, is just like from going from 4K to 150K, it's just like show up and do the work. Yes. You know, that's that's the biggest lesson. Just show up every day, do the work, you know, and, and that's the key to success. Absolutely. And, and you also learn how much people value you putting your thoughts and ideas out there. One thing that's really struck me, especially especially over the last two years, um, especially when I was in the U.S. and I was doing those meetups in different cities and was just getting tons and tons of people showing up, is just how, how lonely people have been feeling. You know, people really do feel lonely out there. We're all interconnected more than ever with the Internet, but especially during this time where people have literally been isolating or stuck in lockdown or stuck here or stuck there, People feel isolated both physically, but also mentally for anyone who is not 100% on board with all of this regime action that's been going on and who doesn't want to just go with the flow and not ask any questions. Those people in particular have been like, yo, what is going on? Am I, am I, am I the crazy person? Are there other people out there who I can connect with and who are voicing some of my concerns or some of my opinions or just asking certain questions because they're not seeing it on TV. They're not hearing it on the radio. So I think just having people, you know, whether it's at a, a massive level like a Joe Rogan or a smaller level like myself or yourself, I think people are just really hungry for those voices just to be like, oh, okay, cool. This is a little pocket of sanity yeah. that I can be in and I can connect with and oh, cool. Like all these other people I can now interact with. And I think it might seem, um, I don't know, you know, to, to go on there and to tweet 10 or 15 times a day or whatever it is, it doesn't seem to a lot of people like that has much value, right? I mean, if you were to try to explain that to, I don't know, your, your granddad or something, they, they, there might be a little <laughs> bit like, wait, no, what's, what's the point of that? But yeah. then when you actually do it and you see you're reaching hundreds of, th not, not hundreds of thousands, you're reaching millions of people, millions. millions of people. And it has an impact. It really, truly has an impact. And um, 
yeah, it's uh, I don't I don't know what to make of it. I th- like you ask me how I, how I handle certain things, and some of it yeah. I do. So the the part of the answer is that I don't really like. I just kind of <laughs> I just I just kind of do it, and yeah. I'm still trying to work out in my brain like exactly what am I doing and what does this mean and where does this go? Yeah, because uh, there's not really a blueprint. Yeah, I, I something I think about Twitter or. I refer to as the fact that we say the things that other people are thinking mm-hmm. and people have questions, uh, people have certain goals, people have certain aspirations. And all we're doing is communicating in a way that that helps them get it, because not a lot of people actually know the thoughts that are going on in their minds in the first place. Mm. They, they just think in these automatic loops. So my one of my core beliefs is the fact that your thoughts equal your reality. So what we're doing is we're helping them put those thoughts into a little bit of a clear 280 character way, which allows them to understand and either agree or even disagree with Mm -hmm. what you have to say. So I feel like we are the man, I don't want to say we're the voice of the people. I definitely don't <laughs> want to go there. Yeah. But I do feel that we are the voice of uh, we are the voice and the, we are the opinions of the things that are already going on in people's minds already. Yeah. And it is on us to talk our uh, truth. It is mm-hmm. on us because if we don't talk our truth and we're just kowtowing to uh, the let's just say the regime or the system and just like trying to get likes or whatever that is, Mm. then we are doing a disservice to the people that are following us. Absolutely. So now I see, actually, I I believe you see this as well, because it comes out when I read your tweets, is the fact that you have this great responsibility now to yourself and to the people that follow you. Mm -hmm. So everything that you say is going to come out in a way that you're taking complete responsibility for. Mm -hmm. And that's a huge thing to put on someone (laughs) like i think you just said like a billion people have been a billion impressions on your tweets right you had more than a billion two billion over two billion this year that's two billion people (laughs) (laughs) that's that's not even a country that's two countries that's multiple countries and for us to be able to have that type of responsibility understanding that thoughts can actually lead to realities and can actually change people's lives uh, I don't, we don't take that lightly. I don't take mm-hmm. that lightly. And, uh, and that's why I show up every single day. Uh, and I, that's the reason I show up every single day. I type on my keyboard. I put my thoughts out there, uh, regardless of whatever people will think, because it's on us to speak whatever truth that we have inside. Yeah. What, what's been the biggest challenge for you during this? Cause I know as someone who's, whose account has grown quickly that yeah. some stuff is just like <laughs> you, mm-hmm. you, there are certain things you expect, but then you also encounter things that you just didn't, both positive and negative. What's been the biggest challenge for you? Uh, biggest challenge is other people, uh, yeah. by far, right? So when you put yourself out there, you're basically going out into public naked and mm. people can take whatever <laughs> shots that they want, right? <laughs> and it's actually hardened me a lot in a sense mm. or hardened my spirit because once you see one, once you see one thing, and someone says like you, know, you put something out that's supposedly like positive, and someone says "f you" or whatever, yeah. that is, <laughs> you know, like I'm not gonna lie, that's been a challenge, you know, it'll challenge anybody, like it's yeah. gonna challenge you. But for me, when I when I when I look at that, the biggest challenge is is also the biggest growth of opportunity. So the ability to see things on the internet that are directed at you that will either you know they can either change your state or they you can see it as like a neutral thing Mm -hmm. that has been the the area of opportunity for me and the biggest the biggest area of growth and it's it's very much like hard in myself to be like hey my opinion about myself is the most important opinion in the world and no one else's opinion is actually the biggest lesson one of the things i realized is that other people's opinions about you or actually their perceptions about their selves themselves, right? Okay. The the amount of like, let's just say like someone throws like unnecessary hate at you. Mm-hmm. I realize that they're not angry at me. 
they are most likely angry at the world around them and themselves. Yes. Most likely, most times. Yeah. So that is something that gives me comfort <laughs> a little bit, <laughs> just a little bit. And yeah. also it's, it's, it's also kind of like giving me a little bit of direction. It's like, Hey, if, if I'm imparting some form of like uh, you know, snapback or whatever it is, what, well, what's going on inside of me right now? Mm. You know, that that's making me do this. So, so I, I, the biggest challenge is obviously just dealing with the mass amount of people that you're bringing into your sphere of influence and, uh, and knowing that, a small portion of those people are are probably just like crazy negative <laughs> you know not liking life yes. so so it's just dealing with that small percentage and, and really giving more onus to the 99 percent of people that love you and mm -hmm. that love the things you're putting in mm -hmm. yeah yeah that's the thing because human human beings are we're, we're we're wired to really notice negativity so if you get a hundred positive comments or a hundred positive yeah. negative, um, sorry, hundred positive messages, and then you get one negative yeah. one or one nasty one, it's always that one that sticks in your mind that the, that you're yeah. tempted to react to. It's just something about the way that we are wired, and yeah. even when you know that, and even when you're used to it, it's still it's still there, and it always bothers you to some degree and you have to sort of train yourself to not react yes yeah. i've i've actually learned this biggest the biggest lesson is actually one that i learned while you know here in mexico is the fact that the hardest thing to do as a human being is to be happy okay. right that is the hardest thing to do as a human being because we are wired for survival mm -hmm. we are wired to be pessimistic we are wired to uh, to actually look at the world in the way that is threatening so for us to be able to find our own happiness mm -hmm. and to be able to uh to prioritize that happiness that to me is one of the hardest things to do and that to me give, gives me a little bit of solace because it's like hey i'm willing to do the hard stuff that other people are not willing to do mm -hmm. and one of the things that will make me different as a person is being able to focus on and and be happy regardless of whatever stuff people throw my way yeah and to have my my prioritization on my own happiness mm. and it, it, it's funny because it, it's kind of sad but there are you realize as well that there are people out there who are as you said they're not really mad at you they're they're really mad at themselves but yeah. they will dislike you and attack you because you are happy because you mm. are positive, right? It's, it would be one thing if, you, right? It's, it's the weirdest thing. It would be one thing if you know you're putting out like venom all day long, and then yeah. people are responding with venom. But when you put out something like really positive, and it's like obviously well intentioned and coming from a good place, and you yeah. still, you still get these people who are just like attacking and name calling and whatever. And I'm just like, man, this is the, this is the weirdest thing. And then you realize it's like, right? You're actually angry at me because. I'm happy and because yeah. I'm doing well and because I'm trying to inspire and motivate like that in itself is what you're what you're mad at what you're mad about you want me to also be a crab and to be angry and to be anxious and to be projecting this all onto other people um you know there's that well-known phrase misery loves company which I used yes. to always hear as a child and I don't think it ever made sense to me I never really clock clocked what it really meant and now I'm like, okay, I get it. <laughs> I really get it. Yeah. People really want to wallow in fear and sadness and anxiety and doubt. And they want you to be there, right there with them. And, and if you're not, I feel like the past two years have been people trying to convince me to be as afraid as they are and to be as angry as they are. And then getting mad at me for saying, no, I'm like, no, I'm, I'm not afraid. And people are like, how dare you not be as afraid as me? Yeah, people are so scared of what uh, they don't understand and what they don't, what they aren't, and we can see this also with some of these articles that are being put out there on the internet right now. Where I have this theory, where the weak are starting to inherit the earth right now, the weak are starting to put out articles, the weak are starting to dictate the flow of information. So when people are feeling not happy when they are not feeling powerful what are they going to do they're going to want other people to feel the same way mm -hmm. 
one of the things that comes out is like toxic positivity. I've, I've heard that term before, <laughs> right? Like that's an oxymoron. You know, whoever says that is, 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 is not an oxymoron. They're a moron for saying that. They're, they're literally too, you can't. So, <laughs> positive. Like, what? Yeah. So, so for me, I feel like we're living in a world right now where people are not necessarily in the best shape. Mm -hmm. People are not necessarily moving their bodies. They're not using their bodies. This has the direct correlation on how their brains function and how mm. they see the world. Mm. So now we're getting all these people who don't take care of themselves whatsoever, who are wallowing in their own self-pity, who are miserable. And they're the ones writing these articles. Yes. They're the ones creating these blogs. They're the ones trying to put out things like toxic positivity mm -hmm. or whatever it is. And that is to they're me. They're also the ones giving you health advice. Exactly. Like, <laughs> like, oh, like obesity is healthy. Like what, what? Like, excuse me. Like, oh my gosh. And, uh, and this, we could talk about the, the body positivity movement and all this kind of stuff. <laughs> but the reality is, is that I am not going to take, let's just say mental health advice from someone who feels not mentally healthy. I'm not mm -hmm. going to take health advice from someone who is absolutely not healthy. I'm not going to take financial advice from someone who's broken poor, mm -hmm. right? These people are more case studies for things not to do than things to do. Yeah. And, and I feel like I don't want to be pessimistic, but I feel like this is kind of like, because of everything that's happening, this, this is where the world is heading at this point. And this is where the, the narrative is heading to. And, and for me and for, and, and I feel like you are important uh, pillars at least from the social media angle, at least from an information angle, to push out the message that that it, that we know is positive, that to yes. push out the message that we know will change people's lives and make them better. Absolutely, absolutely. And one of the things that I guess I find most sad about it is that those people are the ones who need the message the most, right? I'll tell you one. I really noticed this when it when it really hit me was, um, you know, I. I became a fan of Jordan Peterson pretty early on, you know, like when he, when he just started rising in Canada in like 2016, I think it was before he'd been on Rogan and all of that, he came onto my radar. And when I saw the reaction to him, right. And you're listening to his lectures, like this guy is so positive, so insightful, you know, he's literally tell you to take responsibility for your life, you know, clean, clean your room, pick up a heavy load and, and carry it, be the strongest person at your father's funeral. Like he's going deep on all these things, history, psychology, whatever. And then the response from certain people was like, I, I was just like, bro, you, you're the person who needs this message, right? He's, he's literally, and, and maybe that's why people rage because it kind of hits them in the heart. It's like, wait, is he talk? is he talking about me kind of thing? And I'm just like, how can you hate on this guy of all the people in the world, like like of, of all the people in the world who you could come at or attack or want to insult or what it's like you're coming at the Jordan Petersons, you're coming at the Joe Rogans, you're coming at the Dan Goes, you're coming at the Zoobies. <laughs> you, you, you gotta see what I mean. It's like th those are the people you're choosing to spend all this negative energy on when generally speaking, these are people amongst others who are every single day trying to put out advice to help people psychologically, financially, physically, everything. You're, you're, you're there every day trying to uplift other people. And it's, it's so odd and inverted to me that those are, I mean, look, there, there's some bad people out there. <laughs> like there are some people out there like putting out like all kinds of negativity and horrible stuff and all of that. And, but it's like, no, you're going to, you're going to go for the you're going to go for the people doing the opposite. It's very odd. And that's what I find most frustrating, I think. Yeah, it's, it's, it's frustrating to me uh, because I feel like I, I know what the problem is, but mm. no one's saying it. Like mm. no one's even talking about it. It's the fact that everyone is emotionally sensitive. And most of the people that, that go about doing these negative things to other people, they are in their emotions. And they literally think that their emotions are facts. Mm -hmm. That's literally what they think. And we are moving into this period where it's kind of like this gray area right now where it's like, hey, we got to 
we got to understand what's going on inside of us. We got to understand where our emotions are actually coming from in the first place. People are reacting to their emotions in a way where they think that, oh, I'm doing the right thing. I'm mm -hmm. fighting. A, I'm fighting the good fight. When the reality is, is that they are reacting to their own negative emotions and they don't even have a handle or awareness around what they're feeling. Mm -hmm. and, and, that, and we have gone from being in this industrial age where we don't necessarily have to think about our emotions at all. We don't necessarily have to be, or we didn't have to necessarily be aware of them. We, we kept on moving. We, mm -hmm. we were working. We, we were not obese, <laughs> you know, and, and now we're moving into this, uh, this era where people are emotionally reactive. That's number one. They are out of shape. So they are less in control of their moods and emotions. And they think that what they feel is the truth. When the reality is, is that what they feel is a result of the traumas that they faced in life, the environment that they lived in the people that they've interacted with and it has really nothing to do with anything else other than what they're feeling. Yeah. And I, I feel like one of the things we need to do as human beings right now is get in tune with these emotions that we're feeling and do the work. That's why it's, mental health is, is a massive, we're in a massive pandemic, but it's more of a mental health pandemic now Agreed. rather Agreed. than the physical one. Mm -hmm. So now we have to, educate people, not only how, how to be physically fit and in shape, but we have to teach them how to like manage their emotions. Mm -hmm. You have to teach them how to be more aware of them and not react to them and, and throw vitriol at people like yourself and, and myself, people who are trying to make this world a, a little bit better, just like a tiny bit better. <laughs> Yeah. Um, I, I, it's something I think about a lot and I think it's actually, I think it's a really deep thing. Um, and one thing that seems very clear to me at this point is that life is too easy. Yes. Right. People need hardship. People do need struggle in this modern era. If you live in the modern Western world, right. You, you could say that some, some struggle has been created by the governments over the past mm. two years, but generally speaking for the past couple of decades, life has just been so easy. I mean, I could literally sit in this room in this chair and not leave this chair and I could survive indefinitely from this chair. I can have food delivered to me. I can have everything brought to me that I need. I can continue to earn income from my laptop. I, don't, I literally don't need to stand up, yeah. right? <laughs> and that is unprecedented in human history. I can get access to all these exotic foods all year round. They arrive, they're hot, they're fresh. I don't even need to cook. And I think that most of the problems we have in the modern world are problems of excess. I, I think it's it's not problems of, of lack. In the, historically and in developing countries, it's, it's generally problems of, of lack. I mean, if you want to take the most obvious thing, obesity itself. You've got more people dying from consuming too much food than dying. Like, there's nobody, there's nobody is starving to death in the West. Nobody. Mm -hmm. Nobody is starving to death, right? But people are dying because they're eating so much food. There's so much surplus. There's so much excess that that they're they're killing themselves as a result. It's too much of everything and stuff being so accessible and so easy. I mean, it's funny if you think about what we preach, right? We're we're both into fitness. We're we're both fitness yeah. coaches, and we're literally telling people how to make their lives a bit harder, basically. Yeah, right. It's like, right? That, that's, <laughs> That's essentially what it all is. It's like it's like going out of your way to make things a little bit harder. Because if you don't, your body is literally going to atrophy. You're yeah. you're going to get fat. You're going to lose muscle. You're going to just be out of shape. If you just do the default, yeah. if you just do the easy thing, like if you go back a hundred years ago, doing the doing the default would have kept you in shape, mm. right? Because mm. the default involves manual labor and it involves walking around and it involves this and that. Just just living your daily life you're going to stay in shape. Now you have to buck the trend. Mm. You have to do it mentally, right? Imagine if you just you just do you you sit there and you just watch the news, you just turn on the TV, watch the news, reality TV, sports and you just take everything at surface level, you don't question anything, you don't challenge anything, whatever. You also become intellectually flabby, right? You become mentally weak 
because you're just taking everything hook, line, and sinker. You're not questioning any of the narratives. You're not doing any of your own research or anything. So with all of these things, it's like to elevate, you actually have to not do the normal thing. You have to swim against the current. And mm. actually, that's what makes you stand out now. Yeah. I remember I was walking through California. Uh, maybe it was like a year or two ago. And I was walking through and we know that California has a homeless, pro has a homeless yes. problem. I was walking through California with, uh, with my wife. Uh, I, I go around this corner and I see this homeless man. And this homeless man is obese. Mm -hmm. And I'm just like, how does that happen? Like, how, how can you not have money and yet still be severely overweight? Mm -hmm. Severely. Mm -hmm. And we're living in this unprecedented time where people are complaining about how hard life is when the reality is it is the easiest it's ever been for us in the past 50 years, yeah. 60 years. We are living like kings. We're and, actually living and, better and, than kings ever, are. Ever. Yeah. Why, well, yeah. I'm, I'm thinking why limit to 60 years ever? Oh, yeah. 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 Like, like, did kings, you know, we are living in a world where we have this, we have these diseases of excess. Mm -hmm. And even kings, what back in like the 1800s, wherever it is, they never had access to all the resources we have right now. Even like, even someone that's like making whatever it is, like 30K a year, whatever it is, who, who knows? They are still living better than kings of old. Yes. <laughs> kings who actually had the most money, mm -hmm. you know, and, and had all of the money in the kingdom. So, we have to do these things like we actually have to voluntarily force hardship on our lives yeah. <laughs> <laughs> in order to feel more human. Yes. Right. And if we don't do this, then what's going to happen? We, at least from like a, a physical perspective, uh, you reduce blood flow to the brain. Mm -hmm. You, uh, you obviously are not energetic. You're feeling you're feeling more moody because the areas of your brain that blood flow used to flow to, they are actually, you are actually taking away blood flow from those areas of the brain that actually controlled your mood in the first place. Mm -hmm. So now we have to do these things where we have to go and exercise. We have to go and uh, read books and specifically like read books yeah. because, and not go on social media, <laughs> you know, and we have to do all these voluntary, voluntary hardship things in order to make us feel like we are a it's normal <laughs> normal person <laughs> you know i wish i okay i don't wish i wasn't doing what i'm doing I, I love what i do i just wish that i didn't have to do what i did you know mm -hmm. in terms of a career and i and i wish that everyone would just take care of their bodies and force this physical hardship on themselves themselves but yeah but no, that is the reason why personal trainers, you know, got born. That's the mm -hmm. reason why, you know, it's, it's it's the reason why psychologists are are becoming more important in a day and age like today. And if only we we took on this mentality where we actually have to physically and mentally and spiritually force ourselves to do hard things, mm -hmm. that would actually make us feel a hundred times better as human yeah. beings. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, well, I think. It's, I think it's, uh, it's, it's, it's natural for human beings. And if you think about it from a, a long-term perspective in terms of human history, it makes sense to seek the path of least resistance, right? I mean, calories used to be really hard to come by and really expensive. So it didn't make sense to expend a bunch of energy and calories on, on time on things that are not directly productive. So I think maybe that's where that pattern of opting for the path of least resistance, both mentally and physically, came from. Because it was like, okay, if I'm going to physically exert myself, then it's got to be to pull food out of the ground or to hunt down this animal or to defend my village or whatever it is. So I think that's kind of that default human thing. But as, as we said, because the environment has changed, we haven't changed. We're, we're the same. Mm. Like, we're, mm. we're the same as our ancestors. We haven't mm. changed. We haven't evolved. Um, but the environment has changed so, so quickly that now taking the path of least resistance is, is very detrimental. I also have another hypothesis on this, which is, um, which links into the mental health thing. 
and I have no idea if this is scientifically correct in, in, in any way, but I, I have a hypothesis that humans have almost like a baseline level of what you could call anxiety, right? So again, living in the past, you had fear of disease, fear of war, fear of random violence, fear of death in, you know, women dying, just giving birth, right? Like life was harsh, you know, famine, right? Just, just, you were just constantly battling the elements, right? So I think that that anxiety used to naturally dissipate because you're dealing with these day-to-day -day tasks. But in the absence of that, I think it, I think it builds up and it accumulates in people. And I think this is also why you get these overreactions. I think we're living through the, the age of overreaction, whether this is overreaction to a virus or overreaction to someone saying a word you don't like. 20 years ago. <laughs> yeah. Or, <laughs> yeah. So, so it, it, everything's an overreaction, right? Everything is perceived as a much bigger threat than it is. And so you're hearing now everyone's talking about, you know, anxiety and depression and worry and fear and whatever. And it's like, well, the world is a lot safer way safer than it was a hundred years ago, let alone 500 years ago. Um, but that anxiety is still there in people and it, it's got nowhere, has no natural outlet because you're not struggling for food. You're not struggling to survive. You're not struggling for much really. And so I think it just builds up in certain people, especially if, if they're not exercising, they're not going to the gym, they're not doing this, they're not doing all of these other things. And then you've even got factors such as, um, you know, again, historically, all, virtually everyone got married and had and had kids. Whereas mm -hmm. now we we live in this age of um, extended adolescence, and I could I could even you know I could even be talking about myself here to some degree, right? You know, I'm 35. Mm -hmm. I don't have kids yet. I'm going to. Mm -hmm. um, but again, if I existed 100 years ago, I'm sure I probably would have been like the father of like five or six kids by now, <laughs> right? <laughs> just 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 by yeah. default, right? And as a result, I mean. I, I mean that that that's that's enough to keep you busy. You, you know what I mean? Like you're you're a dad. You can tell me, but just just that in itself, just being a parent, it's like, oh, okay, I've now got this multi-decade project here, and maybe I've got three of them, or four of them, or five of them. Um, so I I ain't got time for. <laughs> you see mm -hmm. what I mean? Like I, I I don't I don't have time for all that other things. I have all these things to take care of and to worry about, and my I, I'm not feeling that sort of pathological anxiety because it's going out in all these places. I've got, I've got a real struggle. I've got a real resistance. And so I I'm ha and, and, and ironically that makes people happier. Mm, I, I, number one, I agree with you. The, mm. the body and the brain is designed for survival. Yes. Right. That it just wants to keep you alive. So it will do everything it can to maintain the status quo and to make you feel more comfortable, to make you feel like you don't have to survive, to make you feel like you don't have to go hunt for food or whatever it is. And then that anxiety has to go somewhere. So it is going to go to Twitter. It is going to yes. go to other people's opinions. It is going to go to their emotions, to the way that they're feeling. And I believe that we are reaching an age where I call it the age of entitlement. Mm. And everyone feels like they're entitled to things or not everyone. A lot of people feel like they're entitled to things without having to work for them. Yes. That's why we have this whole movement towards anti-work, right? Like we don't want to work. Well, what, what are you going to do? <laughs> How are you going to live? You, you're going to want, you're, you're going to expect UBI and just yeah. like toe the line and whatever it is. That's, so we're living in this world where we have gone so comfortable that we feel that everything is owed to us. Mm -hmm. And the people that make it and the people that break out of this mold are the people that are literally focused on working for everything that they want in this world, whether it mm -hmm. comes from the physical aspect, whether it comes from their business or whatever it is. And to me, those people are actually the most fulfilled people yes. I meet. Yes. Right. They have a purpose. They know what they're doing, even if it's kids. So oh, yeah. Yeah, going along with this whole age of entitlement thing, it's like the reason people won't have kids is because they are selfish, right? They are mm -hmm. so selfish. They don't mm -hmm. want to give their lives to another person. They know that when they bring this, this child in, okay, well, I'm going to have to be the most selfless person on the planet.
for them to survive. Yes. Not a lot of people are, are ready for that. Not, and, and the thing is, like you said, like I would have had like five kids. I was thinking you would have had 15. <laughs> yeah. <you know? laughs> like, yeah, I was thinking you would have had like a lot. Yeah, yeah. And, and I'm noticing this with a lot of uh, people. And for myself, I had my first kid, uh, first child when I was 40 years old. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, so I'm not I, I don't mean to talk smack on anyone that doesn't want to have kids because I waited a long time and it took me a long time to wrap my head around being as selfless as humanly possible. And I think mm. uh, it was Naval who actually said this, where, hey, if you're not going to have kids, you better be like some spiritual guru who's like <laughs> sitting underneath a freaking tree and just like searching for, searching for like, you know, whatever enlightenment, because you have, to, like as human beings, we actually have to turn from the selfish aspect, the selfish point of view to being as selfless as humanly possible. And that's what, mm. that's again, what makes us human beings. And people are not willing to do that at this point. A lot of people are not willing to do it. That's the reason why a lot of people don't want to have kids because they want to get their careers in line and they don't want to like, you know, you know, spend the time and, and actually, you know, give themselves towards mm -hmm. raising a child. They don't see the point of like, what's the point of like, uh, us, living amazing I mean, there is this contrast they're like we're we don't have everything and we have such we have nothing compared to what other people right mm -hmm. but the reality is if you compare this to 100 years ago yeah, you everything. are living this vacation yes you're living the life that our parents fought our parents and our grandparents and our great grandparents fought so hard to to have us live mm -hmm. and we got there now what are we doing we are uh <laughs> Yes, we are uh, sh shitting the bed, <laughs> right? We're taking advantage of the things that were given and the things that were built before us. Mm. And we are basically making a mockery of all the work that came before us. That's what we're doing right now. So I feel Savage. like so it is. And, yeah, and I no, feel it's like true. I, know. Move, you know? yeah, yeah. I feel like that's why, well, that's one of the reasons why I created this uh, Twitter account. That's probably the reason why you're, you're speaking your truth right now. It's to take people out of this autopilot type of mindset where it's so easy to be stuck on survival. It's so easy to be stuck on comfort and to let them know what is important, what makes a human feel more human. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and yeah, I want to have this optimistic view on where the world is going. I only have an optimistic view on where you and I are going right now. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. I, I, that's the only optimistic view I have at this very moment. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, that's the reason why I tweet. That's the reason why I create content. It's to take people out of this, just like snap them out of it. Yeah. Come on, like snap yeah. out of it. Okay. We are put on this earth for a reason, figure it out. Mm -hmm. Okay. One of the, one of our reasons is to actually, leave a legacy in terms of the kids that we have and the children that we, that we are born or that we born. And, and that is a big part of life. So I hope, you know, people will get around to that, but we'll see what happens. Yeah, of course, you know, yeah. and you know, this is not saying everyone has to do X or Y or Z, right? We're both very pro pro Liberty people. Yeah. Um, but you know, beyond, I think beyond the, the selfishness aspect as well is I think it's another, it's a very obvious example of taking on a huge and permanent responsibility. And that's another thing that is, responsibility is another dirty <laughs> word in, in this culture, right? People don't want to take responsibility, let alone for themselves, let alone for other people. I, you, but yeah. people don't even want to take responsibility for themselves and for their own actions. Um I, I really do think I like the term extended adolescence because mm. I really think that's what it is. It's kind of like being stuck as, in a teenage mode for up until your 30s, 40s, sometimes 50s, <laughs> sometimes 60s. And people never kind of snapping out of that and just being like, OK, let's uh, let's grow up. Let's take on more responsibility yeah. and let's think from a wider and more holistic perspective beyond just, OK, what makes me feel comfortable and pleasurable in this very short moment in time i feel like you're being generous to be honest <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah okay because there's a lot of i mean like for me and uh you know when i when i walk out there it's just a lot of children not even mm. teenagers just children mm. right and children cannot manage their emotions they yeah. don't have the tools yet and some people just have not reached there 
have not reached that aspect, have not reached that level. So I, so yeah, I think you're being very generous. <laughs> you're very, you're a very benevolent guy, um, yeah. Zuby. Uh, but I do feel that one of the core aspects of being an adult is taking ownership of their emotions, learning how to manage them, being aware mm -hmm. of them. And we just, uh, you know, with, with everything, with most of the things that we see on social media, I just don't see it happen. I just, I just don't see a lot of children becoming adults or becoming teenagers at that. Mm. You know, it, it, it's just hard for me to see. So, you know, anyways, I love the world. And I think the world is an me amazing too. place. <laughs> me too, it man. It's amazing. Yeah. My gosh. Like, do we not realize that we're on the screen? You're in the UK and I'm in Mexico and I'm talking to you. <laughs> it's magic. And I can see it's magic. Like yeah. we, we have to realize that there are so many amazing things in this world that have been brought about by people who have come before us because they wanted to make our lives better. Yes. And, and I, and I do feel that you, me, and every single person in the world, especially this, even this guy, this construction worker, that's like walking in front of me and, and going to his job, you, we are here for a purpose. So it's on us to find what that is, mm -hmm. put ourselves fully into it. And, and that alone is going to make us feel amazing. It's going to yes. make us feel like we have something to live for. Yeah, well, I, I think human beings are, I think, ultimately fulfillment and happiness and content, contentedness. It comes from being of service. Yeah. Right. Being of service to other people. And so even if you do want to become successful, however you measure that, whether you're measuring that in in money or attainment in career, whatever it is, it ultimately boils down to being of service to other people. That's actually how you end up being of service to yourself. The more people you help, the more people you get in shape, the more bodies you transform, the more minds you transform, the more income you earn and the more that your business grows and your reputation goes grows and, and so on. And that's really what we're all doing. So when pe if people are kind of stuck in this malaise of not knowing meaning, not knowing purpose, whatever, mm -hmm. anything that takes on an additional responsibility to be of service and to genuinely seek to help other people within your family, your children, your parents, your brothers, your sisters, your friends, strangers, people out there, if you are consistently in service of other people, then you will, number one, become more happy and more fulfilled because we're such social creatures that actually that's where, mm. it, it's sort of the flip side of the thing that most people are afraid of. And the mo thing most people are fear, afraid of is, is social judgment, right? Mm. Being, being looked at in a weird way by someone else, being judged, being insulted, being criticized. This is, this is really what people are afraid of. But if you kind of flip that on its head and it's, like, it's just like, hey, be, be of service to other people online, offline, just go out there. You've got a skill, you've got a talent, you've got a story, you've got experiences, go out there, share that with other people, and you will see how, I mean, look at Dan right here with his 150,000 Twitter followers, right? You put that out there and you will see, oh, wow, okay, this is helping people beyond what I thought it could be, right? Simply by sharing your story, not even really doing anything, just, just sharing your story and saying, hey, I was here, now I'm here, these are the steps I went through, these are the things I did. Someone else sees that, and they can be halfway across the world, and they're just like, oh, wow. And it plants a little seed in their brain, and then they go off and they change things. Just like I, I know you've had people who literally have lost dozens and dozens of pounds who you haven't even directly coached. Mm -hmm. They just follow, right? They just follow, and every day they're seeing those messages and it's programming them in a positive way and it's inspiring them and it's motivating them. And then six months later, they'll DM you and be like, yo, I, I did this. <laughs> you know what I mean? And that, that in itself just shows the amazing power of it. So I literally just had that happen. My, um, uh, one of my assistants actually just like sent me this, uh, this photo and this guy like uh, emailed us. He's like, dude, I've been following your tweets for like the past uh, you know two years or whatever. And he showed me the before and after. I'm like, dude, you're in better shape than I, than I am right now. Like, <laughs> what the heck? I should follow my tweets. Yeah. And I remember, <laughs> I remember I was uh, maybe like 23, 22 years old. And I was working this corporate job that I hated. It was just utterly defeating, even though I was making the most money I've ever made uh, at that moment of time. 
And I remember I was just, I came back home and I was like, I can't tell people what I'm doing. I don't even want to talk about what I'm doing. I'm mm. so ashamed of it. I hate it. Mm. And I remember I, I, I went into, I was in this mall and I was in the food court and I was talking to one of my friends and then I ended up, uh, I needed some inspiration, man. So I just like, I got these, I remember I went to the DVD store when DVDs were a thing back then. And I got this, uh, the sixth DVD set of, uh, the, of the Chicago Bulls six championships right oh, yeah and i and i watched it and then i don't know a light came out and a light came on in my head where it was just one word and it was just like help mm. just what is my purpose help mm -hmm. right that's it like it just people are asking me hey hey you know what 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 should i do how do i find meaning how do i find purpose just help people yes just help people yeah. That's it. Do, do whatever you are most qualified or even not qualified, but whatever you can do to be of service to other people, mm -hmm. do that. Yeah. And then you'll find what you're truly meant to be on this world for. But first, it has to come from a place of wanting to make another human being's life better. Better. Yeah, yeah. absolutely, man. I think that's yeah. uh, I think that's the key. And when I look at people who I know who are the happiest people and the most, I, th I think more than happiness, I prefer the word content. You yeah. know, I think content and fulfilled. I think yeah. happiness can be, um, happiness is also a mood. So mm. it can be a bit more fleeting, but I think contentedness and fulfillment are more long-term things. And they don't suggest that you're always happy, right? I think, mm -hmm. you know, be, being a parent or something like that, like I'm sure there's <laughs> times you, right? You, it's not like, uh, oh, yeah. it's not like just like, oh yeah, permanent happiness, but it's probably permanent fulfillment, right? Yes. But you'll yes. have times where it's, you know, it's, it's up and down, it's up and down. Um, so yeah, like with people, with people I know and people I observe, one thing I do notice, you know, there's a couple things. Perspective is a big one. They have perspective. Another one is gratitude. They, they're truly grateful people who are appreciative for what they have and they value what they already have, not just what they want. Um, and then another one is simply, yeah, they are consistently of service to other people. That's what they've dedicated their life to doing, whether they're a doctor, an engineer, a musician, a fitness trainer, whatever it is, they are consistently helping other people make their lives better in some way, shape or form. And I think that when people hit all those on the head, then it's difficult to not feel fulfilled. I see this all the time with, uh, with my own clients. I don't like, so we, we only help entrepreneurs get in shape. Uh, and I've had a couple of people be like, why do you just work with entrepreneurs? It's cause like, <laughs> I only want to, I only <laughs> want to deal with those guys. Cause they actually have the, you know, they actually have the mentality. And for me, when I look in their eyes and when I look in your eyes and when I talk to people of your caliber, there is this focus where it's like you almost have blinders on. <laughs> and when I see you guys and when I see other entrepreneurs, they have this like just this laser like focus on the things that they need to do in order to move to whatever next level, in order to be of more service to other people. Mm -hmm. And nothing can take that away from anyone. Nothing can take that away from them. And when you have that just like laser-like purpose and that meaning, and you know exactly why you're waking up every single morning. I remember like when I was uh, you know, lazy, dropout, and didn't have any purpose, I would wake up and then I'd stay in bed for like, three more hours, right? <laughs> I'll be like, I wake up and I want to go to sleep and I wake up and I want to go to sleep. Ever since that I found what it is that I wanted to, I've wanted to do in this world, I wake up and I get up. Yep. I, I'm not, I'm not, there's no snooze. I, I don't know what the snooze <laughs> button is. Yeah. I wake up, I get up and I show up. And that to me is like the most exciting thing about this, this whole path. And the most exciting thing about every single day. One, it's like, being able to see my wife and my child when I wake up and being able to interact. And uh, the second thing is like me showing up to Twitter, to this podcast, to everything that I'm doing, knowing that I have this mission and I know what I'm put on this earth to do. Mm -hmm. So there is no more snooze button for me. 
it is just like I wake up and I'm like, all right, let's do this, man. It is exciting. I love that, man. Yeah, man. Dude, that's the perfect way to uh, wrap yeah. this up. So is there anything you've got on the on the near horizon which you want to share with the audience? Yeah, absolutely. So we have obviously we have our uh, high performance coaching for entrepreneurs who want to get into shape. Uh, that's something that we are just continually growing. And I have the High Performance Founder podcast where I go on uh, every single week and I try to impart the lessons that I've learned by helping thousands of entrepreneurs get their bodies into shape. So that's that's what my next thing is. And, and man, I wish we could have like this conversation on social media. It's like I, I know that you're like this you're supreme master at it. And I'm starting <laughs> to see I'm starting to see the the oh man, how do you say it? It's like you start to see the matrix a little bit right when you're on social media and i'm not saying the matrix isn't like hey everyone else is reality blah 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 it's actually starting to see okay well twitter's for this instagram's for this youtube is for this podcasting is for this mm. right and then just you know so now i'm i'm going from like creating stuff on social media to creating more longer form stickier content like you are right now yeah. and the podcast is the next thing for me i just love talking into the mic, as you can see. So, so yeah, that's the next thing I'm working on the high performance founder podcast. Awesome. And Dan, where can people find you on social media? You can find me at, on Twitter at fit founder. You can find me on Instagram at Dan founder, and, uh, you can find me on the podcast at high performance founder. We already have like 20 or so episodes up. So check those out. Amazing. Make sure you guys check out Dan's podcast as well. Dan yeah. go always an honor, brother. So good to talk to you again, yeah. man. Absolutely. Uh, and I just want to say Zuby, I would not be here if it wasn't for that fateful call that we had in the very beginning and you have been an incredible mentor to me and you know what something i gotta say about you <laughs> is the fact that your mentorship is very direct and very and very just like cutthroat and short <laughs> if that makes any sense you're not giving me this paragraph and this diatribe of like what I should do. I literally <laughs> ask you a question <laughs> and then you get straight to the freaking point in like two or three words. And then that's enough for me to be like, oh, shit. OK. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I remember I asked you, I was like, dude, I just hit like, you know, 20K. Like, what should I do? You're like, keep going. <laughs> I'm like, oh, man. Oh, what? OK, I forgot. Yeah, totally. And I just got to say that. Again, I would not be here if it wasn't for you. Totally appreciate your friendship and your mentorship. And if anyone's listening to this uh, and you are looking to, you know, even just like grow a Twitter account or just like be a better person or even just like uh, start a business, like definitely reach out to Zuby uh, because he is way better in person. I don't, like you're great on social media, <laughs> but as a person, you are you are tops for Thank me. You, man. Man. you are tops. That. So I appreciate you, man. Thank you, bro. I really appreciate it, right. man. Yeah, you're welcome.